Good morning, everybody. Uh, please give me a vote if you can hear me and see the presentation. Yes. Okay. So, uh, welcome to the last lecture on histology. And uh, we have two topics for today. It's lymphatic system and endo endocrine glands. And before uh, we carry on, uh, I have uh, one question for you today. So if you go to this uh, to this uh, web page, or use this code, and uh, uh, if you remember, we discussed the histology of large uh, elastic arteries a week ago. So uh, think what what could happen, or speculate what could happen with the aorta when all the elastin uh, that is supposed to be present there would not be formed due to some metabolic disorder, for example, or what, when it would be lost, damaged. What would happen with the aorta without elastin? Any idea? No wind boiler effect. I'm actually not sure what wind boiler effect means in this context, uh, but uh, how would possibly the aorta uh, react? What would, what would be the consequence for the for the aorta as, as, as such. Well, I, I need to Google out what wind boiler effect means in this context. Sorry, I'm not familiar with, with, the, with the term. Rupture, that is one of the most severe complications. Uh, aorta dilates, oh, I got it, thank you. Uh, so uh, there will be, uh, a di thank you for the opinions, you are actually right, and this condition really exists. So if you compare uh, this picture, it comes from a, a healthy aorta of an adult person. You can see the, the repeating pattern of elastic membranes. These are this black wavy um, uh, lamellae, and the, the, the you can, you can see the, the, the reddish uh, muscle cell, smooth muscle cells, the green collagen, the white glycosaminoglycans. This is normal. And this is uh, how the aorta looks with, uh, with, uh, af after suffering a loss of elastin, which are these black fibers on the remnants of this. Most of this is collagen. And it's an aneurysm of aorta. Sorry for the check uh, labels. It should be aneurysm of the abdominal aorta. Let me check it. It's called, in English, it's called abdominal aortic aneurysm. And then it really uh, results in, in, a, in a dilation of the aorta, typically in this uh, subrenal position. And the rupture could be one of the consequences. I believe Albert Einstein died of these, this uh, aortic abdominal aneurysm. Okay, our today's topic is lymphoid system. So forever remember, elastin is really crucial for the, for the, for the elasticity of the aorta. Today we got, got two, two topics. So the first one will be the lymphoid system. And uh, as usual, I have prepared some sketches and schemes for you. You can find the full versions uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, and here, uh, here is just uh, some comments. Uh, so what the parts of the lymphatic system include vessels and organs. The vessels are capillaries, uh, large vessels, collectors, and the largest are ducts that collect the lymph into the bloodstream. According to uh, whether the, the, the lymphocytes uh, do really originate from the organs of lymphatic system or whether they secondary move in, infiltrate these, we can distinguish primary versus secondary lymphatic organs. The primary are bone marrow for B and T lymphocytes, and it's thymus for T lymphocytes. 
The secondary that are infiltrated later on are lymph nodes, tonsils, spleens, and something really, really important that is called mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. That's a significant population of lymphocytes of the human body that is inside our, the mucosa of the GIT, then you call it GALT, or bronch bronchi, and you call it BALT, etc. The secondary uh, lymphatic system have accumulations of lymphocytes called lymphoid follicles. In histology, these lymphoid follicles mostly look like that. Uh, they are uh, accumulated lymphocytes. The darker outer zone is called mantle zone, where the lymphocytes are densely arranged. And uh, if, the, uh, if there is an active immune, immune response, immune response uh, at the moment, you can see somehow lighter center called germinal center where the activated uh, B lymphocytes, actually B lymphoblasts, uh, proliferate. Uh, they are called centroblasts, yeah? these, these activated B lymphocytes, because they are in the, in the germinal center. So if you see something like this, you call it secondary lymphoid follicle with the germinal center. If there is no germinal center, you call it primary lymphoid follicle. What cells are in? Mainly B lymphocytes, B lymphoblasts or central blasts. Then the antigen presenting cells such as macrophages and follicular dendritic cells. I'm not sure you, if you heard about follicular dend dendritic cells before. If not, uh, these are cells with many processes that, are, that perform phagocytosis of antigens. They decompose these antigens and they expose the antigen fragments uh, on the surface together with some other activation molecules, and that's used as a signal for differentiation, differentiation of, of central blast as a part of the specific immune response against the very antigens that carry these epitopes, the, the fragments. So uh, the, uh, only those uh, uh, lymphocytes are become activated that have receptors that are able to bind and recognize these receptors. Okay, uh, we'll go through uh, some lymphoid organs, but the, here is a, a suggestion of a simple decision algorithm. Uh, first, uh, look on the surface of that lymphoid organ, because you will, you will very soon recognize that you are looking at some lymphoid organ because of this dense accumulation of lymphocytes. If you find epithelium on the surface, it must be a tonsil, uh, because tonsils are actually parts of mucosa uh, devoted to the immune functions. If there is stratified squamous and non keratinized epithelium, it must be either palatine or lingual tonsil. If there is a pseudo stratified columnar ciliated epithelium on the surface, it must be the unpaired pharyngeal uh, tonsil, which is in, on, on the roof of the nasopharynx, or it could be the tuberian tonsils. This is a paired tonsil close to the opening of the auditory tube. Okay, if there is no, sir, no epithelium, but a fibrous capsule on the surface, you, you ask a second question, are there Hassel's bodies? I will demonstrate this surely, but once you will see them, you will never forget. If you will find these, you are pretty sure you are looking at the middle of a thymus. If not, uh, you ask a third question, are there blood vessels or arterioles inside these lymphoid follicles? If so, is the white pulp of spleen, if not, if it's a lymph node. So I will start with a lymph node. Uh, very often, uh, an organ that very often undergoes histological analysis uh, by histopathologists when being, after being removed uh, during surgery, for example, to, to answer if there, is, if there are cancer cells infiltrating the lymph nodes, etc. So the histology of lymph node is pretty, important to us. Uh, on the surface, we got a fibrous capsule that is interrupted with the entry of several afferent lymph vessels that have valves in, so the lymph enters in. After the lymph enters in, it spills below the, uh, uh, below the capsule in a capillary space called subcapsular or marginal or peripheral sinus, it means the same, and then it it um, 
enters the first layer, which is the cortex. In cortex, you got these ellipsoid accumulations of lymphocytes, the lymphoid follicles. Then the, the, the lymph is passing through this cortex into a deeper compartment. It's called paracortex or deep cortex. And then the lymph goes into the medulla, where you can find the largest sinuses that will confluence into uh, usually a single afferent lymph vessel. However, this afferent lymph vessel could be an afferent lymph vessel of an, another of another lymph node because they occur in chains very often. The efferent lymph vessel leaves in the hilum where the blood supply also enters and leaves. So we got three layers. It's cortex with the follicles, it's paracortex, it's, and it's medulla here. The, the circulation of the lymph and all the antigens that come, uh, that are carried by the lymph, the circulation uh, is responsible for a very, very um, uh, intimate contact of these ant antigens with all the immunocompetent cells uh, in all these layers. So it's kind of a filter that tries to, to uh, that, that, that makes it possible for the antigens to come uh, in contact with as many lymphocytes as possible. Uh, I will mention one special type of uh, blood vessels that occur here, for example, here in, in the paracortex, these are high endothelial venules. You know that venules usually have a flat endothelium. Unlike these high endothelial venules, and uh, the endothelium has special receptors allowing the B and T lymphocytes to migrate from the blood into the lymph nodes. So there is a recirculation of uh, lymphocytes uh, uh, between the blood and lymph. Um, you know that sooner or later, all the lymphocytes from the lymph are entering the, the, the blood circulation in the angulus venosus, right? But here they can re-enter re the lymph node from the bloodstream via these high endothelial venules. Uh, the lymphoid follicles in the cortex are made uh, mo mostly of B lymphocytes. The paracortex contains mostly T lymphocytes and the medulla again contains mostly B lymphocytes. Why do we care? It's actually because um, there are, uh, are some uh, diseases like lymphomas, which can originate in different compartments. And making a diagnosis of a B lymphoma from a T lymphoma really matters, as you will, as you will hear in pathology classes. OK, uh, I'll describe the palatine tonsil now. Uh, so uh, the tonsils are specialized regions of mucosa with the lymphoid follicles here in the in the lamina propria. Speaking about palatine tonsil, you would expect the, epi the same epithelium as in the oropharynx, right? Because the palatine tonsil could be found in the, in the tonsil or fossa just uh, between the uh, palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal arches. Uh, there is a small like cavity there. So the epithelium of the oropharynx is really there. It's stratified squamous non keratinized the surface of the mucosa is not smooth, but it uh, has these invaginations, or we call it crypts. The tonsillar crypts uh, contain um, remnants of epithelium, bacteria, food, and also lymphocytes, because the lymphocytes are penetrating through the epithelium into, onto the surface of the tonsil. Uh, sometimes the whole epithelium even is losing the, the, the layered structure because the, the, the lymphocytes like make space there. Uh, in the lamina propria, we got these lymphoid follicles. Here is one of these with a germinal center. Uh, the lateral aspect uh, is covered by a fibrous hemicapsule. It's not a complete capsule that will surround all the tonsil because we got the epithelium here. It's only on the lateral pharyngeal side, so we call it like half capsule or hemicapsule. Very often you can find also skeletal muscle fibers belonging to one of these uh, uh, skeletal uh, muscles of the soft palate, the parthoglossus or parthopharyngeus muscle. And sometimes you can see also the minor salivary glands, which are mucus, the, 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 the palatal gland. Uh, 
sometimes you can file a cross section through a crypt because the crypts uh, run in various angles. So in one section, you can find longitudinal or cross section. You can recognize it easily because there will be the same epithelium inside the crypt as on the surface. And the tonsils are already part of the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. And here we have another example of uh, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, this time from, it will be from the smooth, uh, sorry, small intestine. Uh, I can tell because I have the mucosa villi and crypts and this pattern, villus and crypt, villus and crypt is typical for small intestine. And uh, the lymphoid follicles uh, occur either in the uh, lamina propria of the mucosa or in the submucosa. Sometimes they do not respect this lamina muscularis border between mucosa and submucosa, they just penetrate it. You can have either solitary lymphoid follicles as this one, or they become aggregated. The more you move to the up oral compartments of the, of the uh, in, in intestine, for example, the, the ileum, the more they will become aggregated. And so they are aggregated uh, in, in the large intestine as well. These aggregated lymphoid follicles can even have macroscopic dimensions. You call it pyrus patches or pyrus plaques. It means the same. And here on the epithelium, we got some special uh, cells uh, serving to the immune function. Uh, these are called uh, microfold or M cells, and they have this this pocket, this intracellular pocket, and uh, they, they have a special ability to transport whole uh, antigens, undigested antigens, from the lumen of the gut across the cell uh, to this pocket, where they are offering these antigens to immunocompetent cells such as T lymphocytes and dendritic cells. So the immune system here of the MALD is pretty much well informed about the antigens that are present uh, in, the, in the intestine. Uh, why do we need special M cells? Because you know that most, that normally all the antigens before being transported across the regular enterocytes, across the regular intestinal barrier, they are decomposed proteins into amino acids, uh, lipids into, uh, into, into fatty acids and glycerol, um, uh, polysaccharides into monosaccharides, etc. So this is the only chance how to get the whole untouched antigens that carry on the information about the, for example, microorganisms or other antigens in the, in the, in the, in the lumen. There is even an incomplete basal membrane beneath these microfold cells. As a response, a part of the response on the exposition to these antigens might be activation of the proper lymphocytes. The B lymphocytes mature into plasma cells that are producing immunoglobulins that are released uh, on the surface of the mucosa. And this is class A immunoglobulin, IgA immunoglobulins, that become stabilized um, uh, when bound to a glycoprotein called secretion component that is even um, produced by these epithelial cells. So this is the only type of immunoglobulins that can really survive and be efficient on the surface of our mucosa. Yeah? Uh, because other types of immunoglobulins uh, are in, in, the, in the blood, in the lymph, in the tissue fluid, but IgA are responsible for the mucosal humoral immunity. Humoral means, uh, means uh, it's, it's, it's performed by uh, antibodies. Uh, a few comments on the spleen. Uh, the spleen has a fibrous capsule uh, that could be pretty thick. Uh, uh, that's why, for example, when, he, when someone sustain a, a blunt injury of the spleen, you hit someone, uh, there could be a two uh, later rupture of the spleen because of a hematoma that will be growing here. The fibrous capsule could hold the bleeding for a few hours, but it could rupture when the hem hematoma grows. So uh, it needs some observation, right? Uh, the fibrous capsule projects um, 
into uh, connective tissue trabecules that contain trabecular arteries. These are branches of the splenic artery, by the way. And spleen is one of the organs where we can we need to understand the circulation pattern in order to be able to understand the histology and later on the function of the spleen. So let's follow the, the, the how the blood flows through the spleen. Uh, splenic artery enters in the hilum, it branches into trabecular arteries. The trabecular arteries branches into these central arterioles that run through accumulations of lymphocytes called lymphoid follicles. Um, these lymphoid follicles uh, are actually made, here is a detail of this, are made of various populations of lymphocytes. First, there is a periarterial uh, lymph lymphatic sheath, that's the PALS, uh, that surrounds immediately the artery. It's, it's, um, these, these are T lymphocytes here. However, the adjacent uh, part is, uh, is made by B lymphocytes and it has a darker mantle zone and a lighter germinal center. Sometimes you have a marginal zone also uh, outside with more macrophages and dendritic cells. These are these antigen presenting cells. So there are these uh, lymphoid follicles with a complicated structure. All the uh, sum of the, all the lymphoid follicles, you call it white pulp. So sum of all the lymphoid follicles is the white splenic pulp. You can even see it on a macroscopic uh, section of the spleen. If you would cut the spleen, open it, look inside, you would see like uh, hundreds on, of uh, tiny dots of, of a size of a pinhead uh, inside a dark, dark uh, reddish or brown background. So the background is the red splenic pulp. It's everything except the lymphoid follicles of the white splenic pulp. So the blood enters the white splenic pulp first, then it leaves, and uh, the central arterioles is branching into a typical pattern of numerous penicillar arterioles. They are still surrounded by lymphocytes and macrophages. And each of these penicillar arterioles splits into a capillary network. Now the blood has two options. Either it, it uh, directly goes into the venous uh, sinusoids and uh, goes away with the venous drainage, or for a short moment, uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, blood elements can escape through the, uh, through the highly permeable and incomplete wall of, of the capillaries. And they will, they will migrate for a short time in a labyrinth of the red splenic pulp cells, which are fibroblasts arranged in, in sign of cords. So it's kind of a labyrinth. These splenic cords are also named Bilroth's cords. It was a famous surgeon. So uh, they are finding their way to the venous sinusoids. And if they, if they uh, can make it, okay, they will be carried away with the venous drainage. If they don't, they are uh, swallowed by macrophages that are waiting here. And especially the old red blood cells that have fragile um, cell membranes because they cannot maintain the anchorin and spectrin and other molecules that are responsible for the flexibility of the cell membrane that these old red blood cells become trapped here, okay? So the macrophages uh, take care of them. So the red blood cells is made of uh, sinusoids, highland primal capillaries, a labyrinth of Billroth's splenic cords and the venous sinusoids and the macrophages and also plasma cells. So there's a combination between, between closed circulation, that's when the uh, blood is allowed to pass directly into the veins, and open circulation, when the formed elements need to find their way. In human spleen, there, is there are both mechanisms involved. So that's the red and white splenic pulp. Uh, the thymus, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the thymus is covered by a fibrous capsule, uh, from which uh, the uh, incomplete septa can are uh, dividing the, the the organ into smaller units called lobules. So this is one lobule, another, another lobule, another lobule. Each lobule has a somehow darker 
uh, cortex is darker because the lymphocytes and it's only exclusively T lymphocytes. The T lymphocytes are more densely arranged here and somehow lighter medulla uh, where there are fewer lymphocytes. The lymphocytes migrate from the cortex into the medulla and they are leaving via the venules to, to join the circulation. In the medulla, you can also find these strange uh, and but really characteristic um, body, bodies that are eosinophilic. Uh, they are made of partially keratinized uh, uh, epithelium because the, the structure that the skeleton that carries the whole uh, thymus, it's reticular epithelium. I hope you remember this was one of the uh, strange types of epithelia when we discussed epithelia uh, at the beginning of the semester. Uh, it's not reticular connective tissue, but it's really epithelium. The epithelial cells are connected by, by desmosomes and they are providing a network supporting the lymphocytes because the lymphocytes are, they, they, they undergo some differentiation, maturation there. And the thymic ep epithelium is also responsible for. Other tissues that could be found in thymus are macrophages and dendritic cells. Uh, the T lymphocytes, as they, as they mature, are somehow, uh, are not directly exposed to all the antigens in, from the blood, but they are separated uh, via a hematothymic or blood thymus barrier, which histologically comprises um, continuous capillaries, surrounded by basal lamina and processes of the thymic cortical epithelial cells. Uh, the, the, the function of this barrier uh, uh, is responsible for, uh, for highly selective dosage of antigens that are the maturating T lymphocytes exposed to because uh, the, one of the functions of the thymus is to select appropriate T lymphocytes. At the beginning, you got re you have really uh, large, uh, uh, huge variability of all possible of all possible uh, uh, T lymphocytes uh, because they undergo a somatic recombination of genes. So theoretically, they the variable parts of their receptors that are responsible for their binding specificity can bind virtually any antigen that they can meet in the f future. But from this population, you need to select uh, uh, all those that are recognizing the own major histo histocompatibility complex class one and class two molecules, but you need to exclude those that would react too strongly against these molecules. So only those cells that are recognized, that have functional receptors, T cell receptors, but are still tolerating the owns, uh, the body's own major histocompatibility complex. Only those cells are permitted to survive, which is something like 2%. All the other cells will be, will undergo apoptosis. Um, after survival, they are differentiating to T helpers or T cytotoxic, depends on these surface molecules. So these functional uh, T uh, cells are, are the, the, the product of the thymus, and that's why thymus is essential for cell-mediated immunity. Uh, okay, so that's in a, in a nutshell, so the, this, the, they are really isolated from the blood. They are only reacting to antigens that are offered to them by these antigen presenting cells. So they are, I know you're still waiting for second year of physiology of immunity and immunology classes where all these mechanisms will be explained in details. Uh, but my, uh, my uh, uh, task here is to, to explain the histological background for this. So, uh, for, this is just to illustrate there are many mechanisms how the uh, lymph, uh, lymphoid cells uh, cooperate in lymphoid organs, how the, uh, you, you should perhaps know, know the terms humoral versus cellular immune response and how do they cooperate. Humoral immune response 
covers mechanisms that are that depend on antibodies that are soluble in, in the tissue fluids, right? While a cellular immune response is a direct contact with uh, of, of, of uh, lymphocytes with target cells, such as killing the cell with uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes, or the mechanisms uh, depending on cytokines produced, information regulatory molecules produced by T helpers. In real life, all these cooperate together, all these mechanisms work together, and uh, uh, the, the, the immune system is, is using a combination of various strategies when coping with various microorganisms, for example. Um, now some real uh, pictures, I hope you will, you will, you will recognize them uh, now after going through these schemes. So, uh, so uh, we got we got this uh, lymphatic vessels. You can tell uh, they align with uh, one layer of uh, lymphoid, lymphoid endothelium. Inside there is a lymph, which often makes these aggregations of proteins, or precipitate, precipitated proteins, and mostly lymphocytes. Sometimes also also other uh, immune cells could be could be could be present. Uh, this is also a lymphatic capillary with a valve. Lymphatic capillaries are highly permeable. Okay. When comparing to the blood vessels, arterial venule a lymphatic capillary has the thinnest wall with the highest permeability. There are gaps between the endothelial cells. The larger lymphatic vessels, such as the thoracic duct have a wall similar to veins. So there is even smooth muscle, that's the reddish stuff here. There is collagen, that's the blue tissue in this trichrome method. The mucosa associated lymphoid tissue can look like that. Here is one example from the lungs. This is a bronchus, okay? And this is one of the lymphoid follicles uh, with, the, with the immune cells. A lymphoid, uh, part of the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue is also a population of individual lymphocytes that are scattered here in this layer of the appendix or anywhere in the in the GIT. These are these uh, individual lymphocytes in the lamina propria, right? Sometimes the lymphoid follicles are aggregated and we call it Paris patches. Here is one of the M cells with that intracellular pocket. And uh, here is a scheme of the uh, similar scheme we usually uh, we already had. Lymph nodes uh, look like that. You can easily recognize the darker cortex with the lymphoid follicles. Then is the deeper paracortex, and then it's the central medulla. So we explained the scheme here, but here are the real pictures: the fibrous capsule with the fibrous with the connective tissue trabecules. Sorry. Then the then the lymph nodes, lymph nodules. Uh, apologize again, lymph nodules or lymph follicles, it means the same. Yeah? Lymph nodules are these ellipsoid microscopic accumulations of lymphocytes. A lymph node is the whole organ. So don't make the same mistake as I did. And uh, even in this lymphatic nodule that is part of the cortex of the lymph node, you can see the, the light germinal center. If you agree, this is light region. Uh, again, this is a germinal center of that uh, lymphoid nodule. So we can say it's a secondary lymphoid nodule. Uh, the cortex is populated mainly by B lymphocytes, paracortex mainly by T lymphocytes. Well, in overall stains, all look the same. So if you need to distinguish B from T lymphocytes, and it really matters in, for, for example, in diagnostics of lymphomas, uh, of tumors of lymphoid tissue, you need to apply immunohistochemistry that targets the, the, the diverse antigens on the surface of these cells. Otherwise, in hematoxin, they look the same. Uh, as we approaching the deeper portions of a lymph node, we enter the medulla with a large medullary sinuses. Sometimes you can find macrophages here. The macrophages ha have pigments, uh, if they have phag phagocytized something, that uh, some pigments, they retain the color. So otherwise they are huge irregular shaped cells. 
you're in the in the medulla of a lymph node. Again, large middle, medullary sinuses. And I hope you recognize these cells in the medulla with the large cytoplasm eccentric position over the nucleus. So uh, these are plasma cells. We know that the medullary region is populated mainly by B lymphocytes. So these are those that differentiate from, from the from the uh, from the B lymphocytes, the plasma cells. Okay. Uh, look at the high, endoth high endothelial venule. It's really striking. This simple cuboidal epithelium that it, it 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 lets some lymphocytes to pass from the bloodstream into the lymph node. Here, some lymphocytes have been photographed while uh, while passing through the wall across the wall of the capillary. Uh, the, now we're looking into the medulla of, of a lymph node. Uh, we can see we can see the macrophages. Uh, this is from the uh, lymph nodes from the mediastinum, and you know that the there are special macrophages in the lungs that are removing dust particles from the surface of the lung alveoli, and they migrate um, uh, into the uh, mediastinal lymph nodes. So they very often contain these these uh, darkly stained uh, macrophages. This is all the dust and particles we have inhaled and that has been removed from the alveoli, lung alveoli. Okay, the tonsil. Let's discuss a palatine tonsil. You can see the mucus are is forming these crypts that have even side branches. And, uh, and uh, there are some mucus glands in the neighborhood, but here is a fibrous hemicapsule, okay. And in the lamina propria, there are many uh, lymphoid follicles. Here is detail of uh, some of these um, lymph lymphoid follicles. Okay, even with large mac macrophages that are presenting the antigens to the immunocompetent cells. And the thymus. This is a difference between thymus of a uh, young individual and adult individual. So. Uh, there is a fibrous capsule on the surface dividing the thymus into thymic lobules. And each lobule has a darker cortex and a more pale uh, medulla. Um, in adults, uh, the, the, the lymphoid tissue becomes replaced, is replaced by uh, fat, by adipose tissue. So this is definitely a thymus of a young individual and you can see the dark cortex and more pale medulla. Inside medulla, you can find these concentric Hassel's bodies. And again, we got we got this uh, we got this uh, uh, epithelium. It's somehow in the background, right? Because uh, the view on the reticular epithelium is like masked by the dense infiltration of the lymphocytes. But if you look at the nuclei. This is an epithelial reticular cell that provides support uh, to the lymphocytes. All the other round shaped cells are lymphocytes. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an illustration of the um, blood thymus barrier. Here is the blood. Here is the endoth continuous endothelium, basal membrane, and the processes of the thymic cells. Again, this, are, this is a thymic reticulum, the reticular epithelium that provides this network. And inside all these uh, the basophilic cells are lymphocytes. The Hassel's bodies are in the medulla. They are growing uh, with age. There are speculations about the functions, but I, I don't believe it's really understood at these days. But they are, it's a normal part of, 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 of this. And these cells are like collapsed uh, reticular epithelium cells. Okay. And this is the thymus of an adult, mostly only small islets of immunocompetent lymphoid tissue remain. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's this. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, I accepted other students 
but thank you for not, not, not notifying me. So uh, spleen from the surface, uh, you can you can you can see you can see the fibrous capsule. Uh, parts of the same tissue appears inside, but these are already the connective tissue uh, trabecula. And uh, here is the white pulp. This is a staining where collagen is blue, so the connective tissue surrounding the arteries in the white pulp follicles, it's blue. Otherwise, all this tissue is a red pulp. Let's have a more closer look. Uh, the white pulp is made of accumulations of lymphocytes. There are always these uh, central arterioles uh, inside, right? Uh, so this is the periarterial lympho lymphatic sheath made of T lymphocytes. And this is the follicle made of B lymphocytes with a darker uh, mantle zone and a more pale germinal center inside. So all together, the sum of all these uh, of all these uh, Malpighian bodies, it's called Malpighian bodies, body, it's the white pulp. Otherwise, we have the red pulp everywhere, the red pulp prevails. And the red pulp, uh, I have uh, more close-up pictures. The red pulp uh, uh, is made of venous sinusoids, which is one of these. Then these more eosinophilic, um, uh, trabecules of uh, splenic cord cells then the dark macro macrophages and that's it yeah so some um, mo most red blood cells will find their way inside the venous sinusoids but some will be trapped and phagocytized by the macrophages this is a sketch of um, of the circulation we have already described so the blood first runs through the white pulp and then it goes to the red pulp we with some simplification, we can we can say that the immune function of uh, the white pulp uh, is uh, an, an analogy to a lymph node, because in lymph nodes you have a filtration of antigens that come with the lymph, but the follicle, the white pulp follicles of the spleen are doing actually the same, but this time for the antigens that are present in the blood. So really uh, having a functional white pulp of the spleen is helpful when finding uh, some microorganisms, uh, uh, okay, such as the pneumococci or similar, uh, or meningococcus uh, or, or Hematophilus influenza there are specific microorganisms uh, where, where the proper function of the white splenic pump pulp really prevents uncontrolled uh, spreading of the microorganisms that would be called sepsis. So you can live without spleen, but you better get vaccinated against some of these specific uh, pathogens. The red pulp is a filter for blood where the old red blood cells will die and be removed from the circulation. And uh, that's it. Uh, here is a, a very thin preparation uh, of the red splenic pulp. So these are the splenic uh, sinusoids. And here you can see the red blood cells that, uh, as they are, they are finding their way to the splenic sinusoids. And here are macrophages waiting for for these uh, old red blood cells that will die there. Right? And you can see a couple of macrophages with the, the uh, phagocytized uh, erythrocytes inside. So they will decompose the hemoglobin into he the heme group and into the globin, globin protein structure. And the heme will be recycled in the liver because you know from anatomy that the splenic vein is a tributary to the portal vein that carries the blood into the liver. And here is a scanning electron microscopy um, uh, of, uh, that shows the openings in the walls of the sinusoids through which the red blood cells need to enter the bloodstream again. Uh, this is a classification algorithm I've already explained at the beginning.
And now a few, few real pictures testing if we could recognize some unlab unlabeled slides. So I will give you my comments as if I were a student trying to describe this. Uh, this shows the reticular fibers. If you remember, type 3 collagen forms tiny reticular fibers that do not normally appear uh, on our routine slides, but you need a special silver staining method. It's called silver impregnation. And so this is from the, from the uh, spleen, and it shows exclusively the dense supporting network of reticular fibers, because the spleen is made of reticular connective tissue, okay? Here you can see an artery or arteriole, sorry, surrounded by, by infiltration of lymphocytes. So that corresponds with what we told about the splenic blood vessels. Okay, so this would be uh, this would be one of the arterioles of the of the white splenic pulp. This is a lymphoid follicle, but it contains an arteriole. According to that classification algorithm, this must be. Uh, a follicle from the splenic white pulp, and this would be a red pulp. Again, this is to illustrate the reticular connective tissue with the reticular connective cells, uh, macrophages, etc. So this is very often how a detailed structure of lymphoid organ looks like, with one exception, and that exception would be thymus, where there is no reticular epithelium, uh, sorry, retic reticular connective tissue, but there is reticular epithelium. We can see the, an organ uh, divided into smaller units with darker stained cortex and paler medulla. This would be thymus. The thymus contains these Hessel's bodies. Okay. This is an organ with, uh, with lymphatic nodules, but it's covered by mucosa that has the stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium. So this must be a tonsil. This is a tonsil crypt. You can see how the lymphocytes are penetrating the surface epithelium. So the nice structured layer, the, the layered structure of the epithelium is uh, like disrupted by this penetrating lymphocytes. This organ shows uh, some lymphatic nodules on the surface. Then there is a layer without lymphatic nodules, and there is a layer with a different pattern containing large, large sinusoids. So the cortex, paracortex, medulla, that's the pattern of the uh, lymph node, okay? Another picture shows you one of the units of Obviously, a larger organ, it has a darker cortex, a less infiltrated medulla, but with these concentric particles, which are the Hassel's bodies. So it's obviously thymus. Uh, it's an illustration of the high endothelial venules across which the lymphocytes are penetrating, recirculating. The lymphocytes can even find the very same organs they have been before. It's called homing of lymphocytes. This shows us completely different stain, but we can still make the diagnosis. Uh, fib uh, this is a fibrous capsule that radiates into trabecules, and here are accumulations of lymphocytes with blood vessels inside. There's the white pulp of the spleen, the rest is the red pulp, so it's spleen. This is a detail of the red pulp of the spleen with the large sinusoids and the Billerot's splenic cords that really form a three-dimensional labyrinth. This is an organ that contains uh, lymphatic nodules in, uh, in the surface part, that's the cortex. Here there are huge sinusoids, that's the medulla. In between there is paracortex, there is no straight border here. Uh, so it's co cortex, paracortex, medulla, it's a lymph node. This is a lymphatic nodule. Obviously, inside the GIT, you can tell according to the epithelium, it must, uh, and the, the surface of the mucosa, it must be large intestine. Due to the dimensions, it would be possibly appendix. 
Uh, and uh, inside this lymphoid follicle, you can see the, the large, uh, large uh, germinal center. And if you look more closely, like this cell or this cell, you can even see some of the mitotic figures because the chromosomes are arranged in the equatorial cell plane. So the cells are really dividing here. Do you remember the centroblasts, which are the activated and dividing lymphoblasts? Here, so you will call it secondary lymph lymphatic follicle uh, within the germinal center. This is already part of the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue of the large intestine. This would be intestinal crypts or called also crypts of Librocune because you can see the uh, simple columnar epithelium of the intestine here. This is an uh, organ with many lymphoid nodules but stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium on the surface. So this is a tonsillar crypt. This is also a tonsillar crypt. This is a lymphatic nodule, but with some artery inside. So it's white pulp of the spleen. This is red pulp of the spleen. And this is a thymus, like in the second decade of an individual's life. You can see the remnants of the Hustle's bodies. This is also a thymus, but from a younger individual. Do you remember the Hustle's bodies in the medulla? dark cortex, paler medulla. So we can proceed with the, with the other part. Uh, it will be somehow shorter, uh, but it uh, deals with endocrine glands. Again, some schemes at the beginning. I will start with the uh, complex of the hypothalamus and hypophysis, because uh, it's, uh, it's really an important center regulating the homeostasis of our body and it really uh, connects uh, your brain with many endocrine glands. So what is the micro anatomical background for these connections? I will start with the neurohypophysis. This would be, this is a sagittal section or perhaps a median section through a hypothalamus and hypophysis. Uh, hypothalamus is part of the uh, diencephalon. You know, diencephalon has epithalamus, thalamus, hypothalamus. So this is the bottom of the diencephalon, the hypothalamus. It contains uh, associations of neurons called nuclei, such as the paraventricular or supraoptic nucleus. Here is the optic chiasm. That's why supraoptic is the third brain ventricle. That's why paraventricular. Now the axons of these neurons uh, uh, pass through a port called infundibulum into the posterior part of hypophysis. This is made of nervous tissue. You can see it's continuous with the brain. We call it the neurohypophysis. Again, it's difficult to look at the scheme at once. If you, if you know how to see how it originated with all the comments, uh, go to the YouTube uh, channel where it has been drawn from the scratch with all the ex detailed explanation. So the important point is here, neurohypophysis is made of nervous tissue containing the axons of this neurosecretory neurons. Uh, the dilated terminal parts of these axons are called herring's bodies. And from these herring's bodies, two peptidic hormones are released. It's oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. Of course, there is a capillary network here that, that uh, takes away all the hormones. It's supplied by the inferior hypophysal artery. But the, uh, but the um, adenohypophysis, the anterior part, is completely different. It's made of uh, trabecular epithelium. It's made of trabecular epithelium. And uh, 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 what are the cells? There are cells uh, that do not stain. We call it chromophobes. Phobia is fear. Chromos is co color. So they are afraid of color. Uh, then we have eosinophils, eosinophilic staining cells, and basophils. Now, these are not homogeneous cell populations, uh, but uh, the acidophils could be split into cells producing somatotropic hormone and prolactin. Now, why, do, why should you care? Why do students are supposed to know 
uh, which cells are producing which hormones, it's because that in the future you will hear about many disorders called by uh, overproduction uh, of these cells or perhaps tumors from these cells, okay? So if you link these hormones to these cells, you will, uh, you will better understand what, what can go wrong in other subjects. Uh, so it's a uh, growth hormone or somatotropic hormone and prolactin produced by eosinophils. The basophils split into more populations, some of these producing thyroid stimulating hormone that stimulates the thyroid gland. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, well, this is self-explanatory. It, it supports the function of the adrenal cortex. The melanocyte stimulating hormone and two hormones that are targeting the gonads both in male as in, well, in female. Follicle stimulating hormones that in ovaries stimulates the growth of ovarian follicles. And in testes, it supports the circular cells that are necessary for spermatogenesis. They are like nurse cells for spermatogenesis. And the luteinization hormone, which in ovaries promotes the formation of corpus luteum. And in the testes, it's, it, it stimulates the lytic cells that are sources of the uh, male sex hormones. The important thing is here that the adenohypophysis is under influence of other neurosecretory nuclei in the hypothalamus. Here is one of these. The axons are releasing tissue hormones that are entering the microcirculation supplied by superior hypophysical artery. And it, these hormones called liberins or statins, depending on whether they stimulate or suppress the adenohypophysis are transported into the adenohypophysis where we have second microcirculation uh, that carries away the, the own hormones of the adenohypophysis. So that's, that's like it. Oh, I forgot special cells, special glial cells of the neurohypophysis called pituicides. It's pituitary gland, right? So that's briefly. The pineal gland, it's part of the epithalamus. Uh, uh, therefore, it's, it's covered by pia mater. Uh, it contains many capillaries, glial cells, but uh, the cells that really matter here are so-called pinealocytes that are uh, producing uh, melatonin. They are arranged in these trabecules. A melatonin is a hormone uh, produced more in darkness than in daylight, and it provides the synchronization of the, of the day and night cycles. It receives stimuli from the retinal thalamic tract, so the information about the daylight or the dark period of the day is somehow transferred to these pinealocytes. It helps you to synchronize with the, with the daylight. From a histological point of view, we should know that the pineal gland normally contains calcium salts precipitates. It's called corpora arenacea uh, or Acervulus cerebri, which if you translate this Latin term means brain sand. So don't be surprised if you if you find this the particles like that. As for the thyroid gland, you might be already familiar with. Uh, below the fibrous capsule, you have um, a huge population of cavities uh, called follicles. The follicles are normally uh, or typically aligned with simple cuboidal epithelium, but the epithelium could be more flat in the resting uh, thyroid gland. But when it becomes activated by thyroid stimulating hormone from the adenohypophysis, it could be even low columnar cells. So it really depends. Um, uh, except the follicular cells, you have a special cell. Here is one of these. It sits here. It's called parafollicular or C cells, like from clear, because it has really clear cytoplasm. It's producing calcitonin that lowers the plasma level of calcium. So uh, among the follicles, we got, um, we got interstitial connective tissue with many capillaries. These are capillaries of the fenestrated type, uh, you know, from the previous class, right? There was the, the one with the middle permeability. And uh, if you look more closely on one of these follicular cells, what they are doing basically, they are, they are uh, scavenging iodine uh, anions, oxidizing in, into molecular iodine that, that, is transporting, that is transported into the inside. The inside, uh, the substance here, is a colloid substance called 
thyroid globulin, which is a uh, which is a polymer uh, precursor of thyroid hormone. It becomes uh, uh, eugenated, and then uh, then um, this, uh, the the very same cells are removing back. Uh, uh, droplets of the thyroglobulin via the pinocytosis and cleaving it into the proper thyroid hormones, which are triiod thyroidin or tetraiod thyroidin, also known as a thyroxin. And these are released into the bloodstream. So in a low, uh, in, in, in cells that are, that are, uh, that have low stimulation from the TSH, there's a, a huge reserves of thyroglobulin, but this is a histological picture of a highly activated thyroid gland. Uh, we must mention also parathyroid gland. There are two pairs of parathyroid gland uh, um, merged somewhere in the, in the thyroid. It, has, it owns fibrous capsule, and there are two cell populations here. Chief cells that are arranged in these trabecules they are, these are epithelial cells, highly basophilic, and they are producing uh, para hormone. Um, and uh, there are other cells called uh, uh, oxyphil cells, which are eosinophilic or oxyphilic or acidophilic. It all means the same. And this color is caused by the uh, presence of mitochondria. Among there is interstitial connective tissue with capillaries and fat. So, um, we proceed to the histology of adrenal gland uh, in a scheme. Adrenal gland actually are two completely different endocrine glands that are anatomically present in, in one organ. But uh, the, during embryogenesis, they fuse together. So these are like independent organs that become, they became one. And they have also completely different uh, histological structure in the cortex versus the medulla. Let's have a look, a look. The fibrous capsule is on the surface, right? The adrenal cortex is made of epithelial tissue arranged into these uh, trabecules. So we call it trabecular epithelium. But these trabecules have diverse, um, uh, diverse uh, architecture. And that's why you can distinguish three zones. Why should you care? because each of the zones is producing different uh, hormones. And again, a tumor arising in one of these zones could uh, cause diverse symptoms according to the hormones that are produced here due to the overproduction. Or one of the zone can suppress another zone that, and there will be a low production of the hormone in the other zone that was suppressed, etc. So believe me, you need to, to know that the first layer where the trabecules are like bent like this, it resembles glomeruli, so we call it zona glomerulosa, it's producing mineral corticoids. The thickest zone where the uh, trabecules are running mostly parallel with some branching and anastomosis, but mostly parallel and perpendicular to the surface, it's called uh, zona fasciculata. It's producing glucocorticoids. In these cells, you can very often find lipid droplets, and these are lipid droplets of um, precursors of steroid hormones, and that's mainly cholesterol, by the way. And inside deep this zone, the trabecules run in various, uh, uh, in diverse uh, directions. It's called zona reticularis that is producing androgens in both male and female. So here is a pictogram of these three zones of the adrenal cortex. While the adrenal medulla is made of nerve tissue because it's actually a, a, a modified sympathetic ganglion of the nerve system, of the autonomic nervous system, it contains postsynaptic neurons because uh, along the arteries, the first synaptic uh, sorry, the first, uh, the axon of the first sympathetic neuron is traveling here, interpolating to the second neuron that sits here inside. And as a response, it, it, it's, it's producing adrenaline and noradrenaline. These uh, postsynaptic neurons are also histologically called chromaffin cells because they have affinity to some sorts of chromium, which are used uh, to, for, for staining. So this is epithelium, 
the cortex, and the medulla is nervous tissue. I believe you already heard about pancreatic islets and the difference, uh, the difference from the exocrine serous assignee. Uh, so uh, the exocrine serous assignee are regular uh, basophilic cells with round-shaped nucleus producing uh, the pancreatic juice. But sometimes you can see in pancreas um, aggregations of, of uh, endocrine cells. These are also called uh, pancreatic endocrine islets or islets of Langerhans. The architecture here is different. It's trabecular epithelium and uh, the trabeculus are forming kind of a labyrinth uh, and between the spaces you can, you can find blood sinusoids, again fenestrated capillaries where the increased permeability due to the fenestrations uh, uh, can uh, can uh, take in the hormones and take it to the bloodstream. So this is the trabecular epithelium a comp of, of an endocrine islet. It's completely different than the exocrine portion. Although the embryonic origin of these cells is actually the same. And so once we will understand what makes some cells to differentiate it into exocrine portions and into endocrine islets, we will possibly have more options when treating diabetes and so on. So it's under research. You should know at least these types of cells. It's not an exhausting list uh, because the endocrinology of these islets is much more complex, but it's not my task to explain all the details, just the histology. So wait for it for endocrinology, please. But from histology, you should be pretty sure that the majority uh, are the B or beta cells um, that make up 70% of the cell population. And they are mostly in, in, in the center, in the central region. Okay, They are producing insulin. The second co most common uh, cell type are A or alpha cells, like 20%. You can find there more on the periphery of the islets, they are producing glucagon. Uh, then some 5% are the D, D or delta cells uh, uh, here, okay, producing somatostatin. Somatostatin is a typical example for so-called paracrine uh, inhibition. It means it's a molecule that is uh, that finds its target cells in the tissue neighborhood, not circulating in the whole bloodstream, but uh, it affects the na neighboring cells, the cells in the neighborhood, um, uh, actually inhibiting both the A and B cells, because, you know, um, endocrine organs are full of very diverse feedback mechanisms. This is one of these. And they are also F or PP cells, PP like pancreatic polypeptide. It's like 1% of the cells in the islets. So now we go to uh, real pictures. So once we went through the schemes, I always, I, my experience is that uh, then the students are reading the real pictures with, with new eyes and with more understanding. So this is obviously an organ made of two completely different tissues. This is a nervous tissue forming the neurohypophysis, and this is uh, endocrine epithelium forming the adenohypophysis, okay? Together they are inside a fibrous capsule, which is partially removed here, but there'll be a fibrous capsule that surrounds the whole organ. We have already explained the basics of the microcirculation that contains, that connects, sorry, connects the hypothalamus with both neurohypophysis as well as the adenohypophysis. So this is the anatomical background for transmitting signals from hypothalamus into the hypophysis. And here is the interface between neuro and uh, adenohypophysis. This is nervous tissue of the neurohypophysis. And this is already the endocrine epithelium of the adenohypophysis. Now, on the, on the border, there, there are usually uh, small cavities 
uh, uh, resembling some of this resembling well the embryonic period when these two parts are fusing together from completely different embryonic primordia. Yeah, because the neurohypothesis uh, develops from the hypothalamus, but the adenohypothesis travels from the embryonic mouth cavity and they fuse together and become one. Um, if you need to detect the, the, the hormones that are produced here, you need to uh, take the benefits of immunohistochemistry. This is a specific staining method that uh, uses um, antibodies to bind specific antigens. And this binding site is then uh, visualized using some uh, dark precipitate, such as this brown color. So if you use immunohistochemistry against uh, the somatotropic or growth hormone, that's the same, uh, you can be pretty sure that the, that the dark brown uh, cells are producing the growth hormone. Yeah? The same with different antibody for the TSH cells, ACTH cells, LH cells, etc., etc. So you don't see this in, in, the, routine, in the routine sections. Okay. I believe we already have our comments on this, so I go directly to the real slides. This is from the neurohypophysis, showing you one of the herring bodies. These uh, are the dilated parts of the axons uh, of neurons. The bodies of these neurons are sitting somewhere here in the hypothalamus. But here is a site where the hormones are released from into the bloodstream. You can see the capillaries of, of the neurohypophysis. You can also see the, the, the pituicides, which are glia cells, su supporting cells of the, of the neurohypophysis. And again, here is one of the herring's bodies. Here is a wide sinusoidal capillary carrying away the hormones. It's one of the capillary of the, of the microcirculation network and these are pituicides. So it's clearly nervous tissue. Uh, we move to the uh, pineal gland. This is to illustrate the, the brain scent, the corpora arenacea. Uh, it's important because you will later on see, see these, uh, uh, for example, in X-ray, X-ray, if you make X-ray of the brain of an adult, you will see some, some uh, concrements that are absorbing the, 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 the X-ray. So think about the brain scent, if that would be in the, in, the, in the midline normally, where the epiphysis is supposed to be. Uh, okay, again, this is the, the, these are these calcium concretions growing. And uh, here is the uh, uh, pineal gland containing the glia because it's, it's nervous tissue. It's, made, it's part of the epithalamus, yeah, which is part of the diencephalon. So it's made of nervous tissue. So no wonder you can find glia cells. But you can also find the, uh, the pinealocytes that are producing the melatonin. melatonin. Uh, we go to the thyroid and parathyroid. First, the thyroid gland. So this uh, is a typical structure of the uh, thyroid follicles. Here with the uh, simple cuboidal uh, epithelium or follicular epithelium and the thyroglobulin inside. These are artificial microcracks from the histological processing. Everywhere uh, outside of follicles is uh, interstitial connective tissue called also stroma. If you hear the word stroma, it refers to the connective tissue component of, of epithelial organs, right? Uh, okay, and the C cells where I don't believe it's the best example of a C cell because they are usually on the, above the same basal 
a membrane like the follicular cells, but they are definitely have a clear cytoplasm. So this is the interface between the capillary basal membrane, follicular cells, and here would be the thyroglobulin. And here there is both production of thyroglobulin as well as the pinocytosis of the droplets. This is the cycle I have already uh, made a sketch at the beginning, if you remember a simplified version, but in physiology, you will, you will, you will discuss uh, the more complicated steps. Most of these steps uh, are, uh, are stimulated by the TSH. Yeah? So the T3 and T4 are released uh, after that complicated cycle into the bloodstream. Um, we have the parathyroid gland um, with uh, the oxyphil cells or eosinophilic cells. You can clearly see they have different color than the majority of the chief cells and the chief cells are producing the parathyroid hormone. Now, I don't want to go into physiology of these hormones because that would be explained in the endocrinology in the second year in the physiology. But you, I believe you can remember that the parathyroid hormone uh, is one of the hormones that affects the, the metabolism of the bone tissue, okay? And the calcium and phosphate uh, metabolism. From a histological point of view, the oxyphil cells or the acido, acidophilic cells uh, have really many mitochondria. I believe little is known about the function of the oxyphil cells. They are important, but we don't at present really completely understand why. Sometimes you might have impression that the human body has no secrets uh, from us, but yes, it does. Um, and here is uh, one of the illustration how the, how the parathyroid hormones uh, can affect the activity of osteoblasts, okay, or osteoclasts, therefore affecting the, the, the balance between the the uh, formation of new bone tissue and, uh, and uh, remodeling of bone tissue via osteoclasts. I believe it's useful to remember that, that parathyroid is linked to, linked to these processes because you will definitely hear about disorders of bone metabolism due to the uh, over, overproduction or low production of um, thyroid hormone, oh, sorry, parathyroid hormone, okay? Now, another picture of parathyroid showing you the difference between the acidophilic cells and the chief cells. The chief are the producers of the parathyroid hormone. So, just more examples of the same acidophils and chief cells, a clear, clearly visible difference. Uh, the, uh, these hormones are even uh, more deeply involved into the regulation of uh, calcium metabolism. Again, this is just for you to leave the histology with the impression it, it, uh, it's, 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 it's bound to the metabolism of the calcium. I go back to the histology uh, and uh, this time for ad adrenal gland we can see that there is the, there's the cortex and inside we got, uh, we, got, uh, uh, we got the medulla inside as a, as a sandwich structure. Uh, I go to the pictures, yes. Uh, here is the fibrous capsule and here is the cortex and this is the medulla. If you use some uh, other staining methods with more contrast, you can see that uh, the cortex stains different from the medulla with the salts of chrome. That's why the medullary cells are called chrome affin cells. And the, everybody should be able to, to distinguish the three zones of the cortex. If you agree, the trabecular epithelium here does this, this glomerular architecture. So this is the zona glomerulosa here and here. The thickest being the zona fasciculata here and over here. 
and the deepest being the zona reticularis here. We already know that here are produced mineral corticoids, such as aldosterone, here glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, and here um, androgens, such as uh, testosterone or dehydroepiandrosterone. More a close-up view of this uh, of this uh, layers of adrenal cortex. I, I believe uh, you can see the white droplets inside. This is cholesterol uh, because the synthesis of steroid hormones starts with the cholesterol molecule. And uh, normally in routine histological sections, you don't see the lipids because they have been dissolved and washed away. But if you use some special staining just to stain the lipids uh, in red, you can really see how many lipids are there in the cells that are producing steroid hormones. The, 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 the formation of the steroid hormone molecules occurs mainly in the smooth endoplasmic retic reticulum. Uh, this lower picture sh shows you the, uh, the adrenal medulla with some connective tissue stroma and the chromaffin cells that are producing adrenaline and more adrenaline. And of course, capillaries. All the endocrine organs uh, have uh, capillaries, very often fenestrated type capillaries or, or dilated sinusoidal capillaries. Okay, and this is one of these chromaffin cells uh, of the adrenal medulla. This is not for you to remember at the moment. I will leave this to chemistry or biochemistry classes. But this is just to, to remind you that really the steroidogenesis starts with the cholesterol that we can see in histological sections as these lipid droplets, okay? Uh, okay, this is to remind you of the fact that the cortex and medulla, the adrenal cortex, adrenal medulla, have uh, their own uh, microvessel networks. Uh, there is a huge anatomical variability in the suprarenal arteries. There could be usually three, the superior, medial, and inferior adrenal artery, but they could be vari variability. And they are uh, microvascular networks that take the hormones from the cortex. And there is a bypass here supplying the medullary, uh, venous sinus, uh, medullary microcirculation, but both and in the, in the largest veins of the medulla, okay, that uh, form the uh, suprarenal vein. And we go to the endocrine portion of the pancreas. This is uh, to illustrate one of these pancreatic islets in hematoxin in the stain, and this is some kind of trichrome stain. Uh, so if you agree, it's completely different architecture here in the endocrine islets when compared to the exocrine portion. So every student is supposed to be able to, to find and identify these islets. There is over 1 million of these islets. They are mostly uh, uh, in, the, in, in the cauda, in the tail. And you can see the capillaries here among the uh, trabecules of the endocrine epithelium. And if you really want to prove the presence of insulin in the beta cells, this is a picture of a normal, healthy, uh, healthy uh, distribution of insulin. The green signal comes from a specific proof for, of, of insulin. Okay. While this is a picture of a, di of a diabetic, of, of, a, of a pancreatic islet of a diabetic experimental animal. So you can see the, the green signal is lost. This refers to the type 1 diabetes where the, the, the beta cells, the producers of insulin, become target of an autoimmune response. So the uh, patient's own body, uh, the immune system is destroying the beta cell, the beta cells of the islets. Therefore, uh, the patient is not able to produce enough insulin. That's type 1 diabetes, okay? Well, the good news is that, that we have a 
large reserve of pancreatic islets. Uh, so for some time, you can compensate uh, this uh, by the activity of other islets. But it's actually at the same time a bad news that sometimes happens in medicine, <laughs> that the good, same thing could be good and bad. The bad news is that once the symptoms, uh, once you will find symptoms of diabetes in your type 1 diabetes patients, it means, unfortunately, that the majority of the um, of the uh, of the islets has already been lost. So there is a huge research these days how to how to diagnose uh, the the first steps and the early phases of the destruction of the beta cells, so you could somehow interfere with knowing what's happening. Uh, this is just to illustrate the A, B, D, and F, or PP cells. Well, you remember the most numerous are the B cells. When you're looking for, for pancreatic islets, just feel free to use the lowest magnification. It, it's very easy to, to find these. And here are uh, like more uh, cycles uh, of the, or phases of the insulin production. You will discuss it in, in physiology. It has consequences for uh, diagnosis and treating treatment of diabetes today because uh, these various phases could be facilitated or inhibited in using various drugs. So for now, I'll leave you just with an impression that it's uh, that the biosynthesis and release of insulin, it's a complex process in these beta cells. You will hear more about that. Well, we need insulin um, because most of the cells of our body uh, use it uh, to, uh, to be, uh, for being able to, to take in the glucose because the glucose transporters need the insulin. Without insulin or without cells being sensitive to insulin, um, the cells uh, are literally starving for insulin being surrounded by too much glucose. So it's a paradox, but that illustrates the, the essential and really, really important function of insulin. Uh, okay. And uh, there are many more types of diabetes that, than this scheme would suggest. You will hear about this later. But for now, just uh, you can remember that uh, this is the this is the lack of insulin because of destruction of B cell. It's type one insulin. It's an autoimmune disorder. Okay. And uh, but the majority of uh, uh, patients with diabetes in in industrial countries suffer from this one, type two diabetes, where there could be insulin, there could be more insulin, there could be less insulin, but the major problem is that the peripheral tissues, such as adipose tissue and uh, muscle tissue and so on, it's not responding to the insulin correctly. So, uh, this was some background for your future endocrinology studies. And uh, again, if you wonder what would be part of the exam in the second year, uh, uh, here are the outcomes for these two, two lectures. It's only one page per topic. So it's reasonable to go through if you just uh, use it as a checklist. If you know everything, if you understand what's going on, if not, uh, ask uh, your teachers. And uh, this was the very last uh, lecture in this semester so thank you for working together and uh, i'm looking forward to to meet you in the second year uh, hopefully under better conditions and uh, you will carry on with the histology and embryology uh, mainly uh, in lectures we will deal with embryology so everything between a sperm and all side on one side and a newborn on the other side so that's embryology how do we how do we develop what's the, what's the prenatal development of human body and second in our practical classes you will go through the organ histology or microscopic anatomy of all the organ systems 
of the major or organs and organ systems of the human body in, in, uh, in pretty much more details than we did in this semester. So I hope the general histology uh, will help you to not, how to not get lost. And let's uh, see you in the second year. And good luck in your exams. If there are any questions, just use the, use the chat. Otherwise, uh, I'm saying goodbye.